So for one year, we had these regular meetings. And after one year, when I was 20 years old, early in the morning, I was in my house and there was a knock on the door. I opened the door and there was like 10 offices in front of the house. Say, we have to search your house by the order of the court. And I was so shocked what's happening. And they came in and my sisters, my mom and everyone was sleeping and started shouting. They woke them up and they were like crying and they collected everything about Christianity and put handcuffs on me, my dad, my sister, my brother and put us separately in cars. Hi guys, welcome back to Raw Mission. If you're joining us for the first time, it's great to have you with us. In this podcast, we want to take you to villages, towns and cities around the world. Where finding a follower of Jesus would be like finding a needle in a haystack. Where there are often no churches and no gospel workers. We want to show you what God is up to. How his kingdom is expanding and growing, even in the most unlikely places. I'm Matt, your host, and today we have an incredible story to share with you. I interviewed Mujtaba Husseini a couple of weeks ago in Oxford at our Neighbours and Nations conference. Mujtaba is from Iran and has a powerful story of coming to faith, leading underground churches, being arrested and imprisoned more than once, and eventually escaping to the UK. Mujtaba, welcome. Welcome to the Raw Mission podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. I was introduced to Mujtaba through a mutual friend of ours in London. Mujtaba, I want to just start with a little bit of background. Tell us uh, where you grew up and a little bit about the country and, and life just growing up there. So, yeah, my name is Mushtaba, as Matthew said. I'm from Iran, from a city called Shiraz. I'm from a big family, one of six, and from a nominal Muslim background. Uh, I've got such a lovely and warm family. Uh, when I was a child, I had such a great relationship with my dad, with my siblings. And, uh, you know, that Iran is being ruled by Islamic dictatorship, only Islam is allowed to be practiced as a religion. Free. It wasn't always that way, though, was it? I mean, uh, when did the Islamic regime take, yeah, it was, take over? I think 1979, mm -hmm. the Islamic revolution happened. Before that, in Shah time, uh, it was more kind of free. Uh, Shah wasn't very democratic from what I uh, okay. studied. He was another version of dictatorship, but very low. I mean, mm, it was much softer. people, much softer people. Uh, still happy to have him rather than the imams. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so I grew up in this environment. In the school, they would teach us Islam and Quran. And we had to study Arabic. And when I was around 13, 14, I practiced Islam a little bit, but it wasn't my thing. And growing up between age maybe 11, 12 to when I was 18, uh, that, that, that period of time was the darkest period of time for me and for my family. For a few years, it was my older brother who was struggling with his mental health. And he left school. He started going out with very bad friends, mm. started using drugs and being involved in lots of fights and became a very violent man. He wasn't like that when I was a child, but I think his relationship uh, with my dad at that time was very different with my relationship with my dad. Mm. I had such a good relationship with my dad. How old was your brother compared to you? Two or three years older or a six lot older? Six years older than me. Mm, six years. And it was because that generation, my brother's generation, most of them were struggling with their relationship with their dad. I think it was because of the, after the revolution, after the war between Iran and Iraq and the like economic situation went down very badly mm -hmm. after Iran's uh, government, their relationship with Western governments wasn't going well. And mm. so I think the whole thing caused that became overwhelmed and depressed. Or, mm -hmm. Because uh, of unemployment, yeah. because many of them had fought in the war perhaps then with yeah. Iraq yeah, and yeah. had come back traumatized yeah, all, perhaps. All the trauma of all these events. Mm. So it caused my brother to become like this. And... So he also in, in the house, he started making lots of troubles and conflicts and he became really violent at one point. Yeah, it was so bad that every day we had a fight in the house. Mm. And I was younger and he always would come to me and fight with me mm. and I couldn't like fight back. So it was really difficult for me as a teenager to going through that every day having fight with my brother. Yeah, when your own home becomes an unsafe place. Yes. That's yes. pretty scary. Yeah, so um, there, there wasn't any peace in the house. Yeah. 
And I was really, really hurt by the way that he was treating me. And so because he was staying at home constantly, mm. I decided to go out with negative friends doing negative activities and express my anger and bitterness outside. And at one point I felt I'm so empty, I'm so meaningless and mm. constantly angry. And especially uh, for young people in Iran, they can't see any future for themselves. The government has taken away all their hopes, all their opportunities. Because you can't imagine traveling, you can't imagine yeah. getting a job that's secure. Yeah. You're constantly being watched. Yes. And going to university is very difficult. You have to take this very difficult exam so you can enter a university. So many people can't do that. There is a impossibility in front of you that I can't do this. I can't do that. And there is a huge sense of disappointment among young people. It's the air. It's like you breathe that oppression every day because like as a young person, another thing was you couldn't have any kind of so simple funds you couldn't have. Like imagine you, you wanted to date someone. If you walk in the street as a, like a boy with a girl, there is this um, morality police will stop you and say, what is your relationship? And you have to explain. And if you're not engaged or married, they will take you and they find you. And it's just horrible. You constantly need to hide things. And if, if you want to have a party in your house, they will come and arrest you. There was this water gun party in a park that young people had. And after that, like many of them were arrested just because any joy, any happiness, they are against it. Let's say it like this. It's very dark. It's just the darkness. Yeah. Like a, a boy proposed his girlfriend on a, like a shopping center. He nailed down and he proposed and he like decorates the place very nicely. And they arrested both of them because they say you are advertising Western and traditions. culture. Yeah. Not the Islamic this way. Is not, you should go through your family. Yeah, it's, it, you mm. should, yeah, it's, it's not the traditional way we're doing it. I mean, the first thing I hated that happened to me was when I was seven years old, going to primary school, they shaved my head and not, not only me, everyone, they had to shave it and they had like have this ceremony. The first day you all kids going in the school and they start shaving everyone's head. And I, I, I remember I was really uh, uh, little, but I was so mm. angry. Why are they doing this? I don't want to shave my head. We don't appreciate the freedoms we have here. And you're talking about an environment where there's a lot of control over what you think about, what, how you act in relationships, books. You, you only can read certain books. Book clubs are renowned in Iran for being closed down and people taken to jail for reading the wrong books. You know, people have like two lifestyles, one, one lifestyle in the house and one lifestyle out of the house. Iranian people, the majority of them, they're not really a fan of like Islam. It's, it's very interesting that like the national TV is very Islamic. Every channel you open is just something about Islam or just very, very boring programs. And uh, that's why almost 100% of the houses, they have satellites. And I mean, almost every household, they watch this kind of foreign TVs rather than mm. the Islamic Iranian TVs. So that's why, yeah, the lifestyle inside the house is very, very different with outside mm. the house. Yeah, especially for the ladies, I guess, yeah. who, who have the freedoms inside the house. Yeah. But as soon as they step out, they have to be accompanied by a relative. They have to dress very conservatively. Yeah. But yeah. nowadays it's very different in some part of the Iran. You know, you go and you see a little a glimpse of freedom there. Mm. And it's becoming more and more, especially with the young generation. Yes, they're they, starting they to accept. stand up to yeah. the regime. Let, let's yeah. just go back into your story again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're a teenager. You're getting very frightened by your home situation with this angry brother who's getting violent and, and into all sorts of bad things. How, how did the changes start? So I was uh, nearly 18 when my brother started to go to the Narcotics Anonymous meetings to get rid of drugs. And there was someone there who was a converted Christian, spoke to my brother about Jesus, shared the gospel with him, gave him a Bible. And my brother prayed with him, accepted Jesus. And he literally, after the prayer, he was just completely changed. And he had this very powerful encounter with Jesus. And 
he got healed from many stuff. Mm-hmm. He he was just very calm, very kind, and coming home like, yeah, I, when he, he needed something, asked me very politely, and I said, <laughs> "What's happening? I I don't understand this." It was so weird, especially seeing a book in his hand. You know, mm. I knew that he's, he's not someone who will study, uh, read a book. Just seeing a book in his hand was a miracle. I said, mm. "What? He he's reading a book, and um." And the book was written in Farsi, The Good News of Jesus Christ. And I became interested because I was struggling with my life. And it was very interesting. It was like God was preparing me for meeting him. Because around a month or two months before I see the changes in my brother, I was just keep feeling this a sense of emptiness. And it was so deep that literally I, I didn't want to live anymore. It's just nothing can make me happy. Nothing can satisfy me. I was just feeling so empty, so depressed. And then I was just questioning everything, questioning life, just questioning why, why, mm. why. I, I was looking for an answer. I was looking for a solution. And I remember I had a, uh, before this happened to my brother, I was in my bed one night and I was just feeling that I can't continue like this. And for the first time in my life, I prayed to God in my own way, in my own language. I, I thought that when I and whenever I want to talk to God, it should be through namaz. The, Ritual prayers. The, the Islamic prayer yeah. that in a certain time with a Arabic language. And uh, yeah, I just said, God, I don't know who you are or what you are. I just presume you are the creator of this creation and at this point of my life I don't care about your religions your holy people the Mm. prophets who is good who is bad if you are there just save me from this situation Mm. and when I think back I wasn't really a fan of God or listening to satanic metal music and just because you know I was a rebel boy you know Mm -hmm. I had this view that if you are a sinner you're going to hell anyway so it doesn't matter you are in the beginning of hell mm. or in the depth of hell. You are in hell. You will suffer. And that was a very dangerous worldview. <laughs> you mm. know, it just makes you to do everything you want. God is good, but I know I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm definitely mm. not going to he- heaven. So what's the point? Mm. You know, just let's do whatever we want. And uh, so praying to God that night with this context, it was a God moment. It wasn't really... God was preparing me for meeting Jesus a few mm. days later. Mm. And um, so, yeah, the, the, the changes happened to my brother. I became curious and he was watching some videos. One particular video was two pastors sharing the gospel. And I, I don't know what happened. I just said, can I watch one of the videos you're watching? I said, sure, which one do you want? I said, yeah, two guys are talking about Christianity. So my background with Christianity I knew that Jesus is a prophet, a very good prophet. Even even in Quran, in Islam, he has a, such a high position. Yeah, They respect him so much. And in Iran, especially in our poems, we have Farsi language is the language of poem. And we have lots of poems and poets that using Jesus uh, in their uh, poems, mm. uh, in which such a high respect. Mm. Celebrating his goodness yes. and his prophethood. Yeah. Or- and mm. sometimes there is one of them particularly people think that, or maybe he converted to Christianity, that poet. So yeah, Iranians kind of have a high respect for Jesus mm. because he was very loving. He never got married. And when they compare it to Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, they say, oh, he had lots of wives. Mm. One wife he had was nine years old. So Iranians always become angry with these things. And look at Jesus. He was single for all of his life. So wow, yeah. it's amazing. And, and did you know any Christians at all ever growing up? Not really, hmm. but we we had lots of Armenians and uh, mm-hmm. Assyrians in Iran that mm. they are like the official Christians in Iran. And we have lots of church buildings, beautiful church mm. buildings, traditional church buildings that was built uh, before the revolution, okay. like Anglican or mm. Assyrian churches. So kind of family in that sense not really sure. in touch with people okay so then what happened so yeah i watched the video the video started and it was very interesting the title was god is love i said what god is love i mean it, mm. that language was so new and radical for me mm. in that islamic context because you always have this master and servant relationship with god he's always up there command you to do this to do that 
if you're not doing it, he become angry. He's judging you. Mm. You know, he pour out his judgment on you. But hearing God is love was very fresh. And yeah, that sentence it was really attractive to me. I became really interested and started watching it. And so yeah, the pastor starts to talk about the whole message of gospel that we are sinners and Jesus came for our sins. We are meant to be in relationship with God. That's why we are created. And God has called us to go back to his relationship. And towards the end of the video, he started to say, if you want to experience this, the new life in God, being set free from addiction, bad habits, this, 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 bitterness, and everything he was saying, it was just for me. And I mm. said, oh my goodness, what is this? I want that. And he made this invitation, if you want, pray with me. And I prayed. Uh, I whispered the prayer because my brother was there. I didn't want him to understand what I'm doing uh, mm -hmm. just because we didn't have a good relationship. And also I was proud, you know, I didn't <laughs> want him to say, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. doing it, you know. So I did it. I mean, throughout the video, I was feeling a sense of peace that I never experienced before. But when I did the prayer, I just felt something lifted off from me and I became so light that on my chair, I was just physically, I was affected by that. I couldn't move. Hmm. It was just, I want to go to sleep and just rest. It was such a sweet feeling. I mean, I couldn't even describe it. At one point, I had this feeling that whatever I'm hearing or this Jesus is very strange, but at the same time, it's just like I know him for the whole of my life. It's mm. just, it, there was a contrast. I couldn't explain it that he's so foreign to me, alien to me, but at the same time, he's very familiar to me. It's just like I know him. And I felt like I'm a lost child going back home. Mm. And then I woke out from my home as a habit that every day I would walk out going to my friends, gathering friends, just faffing around, doing nothing on the street. But that day I was just like literally sitting there like this and just enjoying the peace I had. And I realized that when my friends are swearing, hurting my ear, I mm. said, oh my goodness, I, I'm noticing all these negativities, you know, and I can't smoke anymore. I can't do this. I can't do that. And after two weeks, I couldn't be with my friend anymore. I just wanted to spend time with myself and just reading the Bible constantly. Mm. And I couldn't understand a word. Mm. I just became so confused about everything. But at the same time, I just wanted to read, 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 read. Sharing this podcast is a really good way to encourage more people to get involved with God's great mission, whether locally or globally. So please do help us get the word out there. If you use an iPhone, it's pretty easy to write us a review and that has a big impact on how many people can find us. Alternatively, you could share one of your favorite episodes with some friends, your church family, a home group or a CU, whether in person or on WhatsApp or social media. Thanks, guys. Now let's get back to the interview. And so I, your, your brother had given you a Farsi Bible to read? No, no. When he was going out, I would go to his room and take the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was... <laughs> And it was really interesting, like mm. uh, laying down on the bed, just reading the book constantly. And I remember when I came to the book of John, the gospel of John reading, in the beginning there was word and the word was with God, the word was God. I say, what? Mm. What are you talking about? But it was very interesting. I was so confused, but I wanted to continue just mm. reading it, you know? I don't know what, what it was. It was just the power of Holy Spirit, that new birth of Holy Spirit. I experienced that and he was giving me the desire of reading mm -hmm. the Bible. And I also I had the desire of like seeing other Christians, you know, mm -hmm. just spending time with myself, like on the street. And I started to appreciating the nature. Yep. I started to have this very strong till now. I'm, I've become really close to nature mm -hmm. and I really like photography and just 90% of my phone storage is about trees, flowers Lovely. and stuff. That's and so I good. started to have this noticing the beauty around me. Yeah. And it's just like Jesus washed away all the mm. bitterness, the negativity. And mm. after like a month, something happened. My my brother's friend was coming, the man who shared the gospel with my uh, brother. He wasn't free. He couldn't come all the time. But he was coming to his room together. They were like praying worship songs and talking about Bible. And one day particularly, I was always going behind the door listening to them. Uh, especially when they were playing guitar and stuff mm. uh, and singing the beautiful songs. I, I just loved it. It gave me so much peace. And one day they were talking about Trinity and 
It was like, yeah, Father God, the Son of God, Holy Spirit, three in one, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And it says, I had enough of all this confusion. I don't understand how many gods we have. And then his friends left. My brother came out and I asked him, uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. How many gods we have? Mm. So why do you ask? Say your friends was talking about like Jesus is God. I'm so confused. I thought we have only one God. Mm. And he said, why are you so interested? I said, you know what? A month ago when you played the video for me, I prayed at the end of the video and this happened to me. I'm, I'm literally another person. I'm changed. And he hugged me and he, it was such a beautiful moment. He hugged mm. me and said, oh, brother, you are a Christian now. I said, what? <laughs> this happened to you it's like they call it new birth in Holy Spirit anyway we start to just like chatting about Jesus and sitting together praying doing the worship songs and it was just like the whole house atmosphere was changed you know from it's... the fights and conflicts and yeah. the whole tension and that horrible feeling constantly every day something going bad happened now we are two brothers sitting together and just praying to God. And, Praise God. It's you know, just amazing, isn't that it? Peace. Amazing to hear your story. I, I, I want to just let you keep talking for hours, but because of time, he wasn't the only one in your family who came to faith. Oh, yeah, and who after else? that, very quickly, my older sister, she became really interested. I didn't have the best relationship with her as well. I think for six months, I didn't talk to her. And it was, I think, the third day or fourth day of my conversion after I became Christian. I was literally sitting and watching TV and I had this very strong voice in my heart. She said, right now, go to your sister's room and say sorry and kiss her and hug her. Literally. And I know myself, I was so like a stubborn. I, for six months, I wouldn't even look at her. I went and hugged her and it was such a beautiful like sweet feeling, a nice feeling that when you break that kind of unforgiveness or... forgiveness and just, mm. but it was the Holy Spirit that started working in me, mm. like bringing reconciliation with my brother, with my sister. And I had another friend that I <laughs> didn't talk to her for mm. a long time when man started our friendship together again. So yeah, my sister see that we are so different now. I remember she was researching like about religions a lot. So she came, gave her heart to Jesus. And then my dad, he gave her, his heart to Jesus as well. So it was four of us. And we were desperate to find other Christians. Me and my brother went to this big building, uh, the official uh, church in our city. And knocked the door, the guy came out, said, hey, we are Christians. We just became Christian. Can we come in? I said, no, sorry, we are banned from the government. We can't uh, let anyone in. So that day we realized, oh, how we can find Christians. Long story, we found some Christians after a while and like two families, one, first one family and then in such a miraculous way, another family, which they became with me, the main leaders of our house churches. So for one year, we had these regular meetings. And after one year, when I was 20 years old, early in the morning, I was in my house and there was a knock on the door. I opened the door and there was like 10 offices in front of the house. Say, we have to search your house by the order of the court. And I was so shocked what's happening. And they came in and my sisters, my mom and everyone was sleeping and started shouting. They woke them up and they were like crying, coming out. It was a horrible, horrible feeling. Mm. You know, these people in my house, did, right in the middle of my house. Did they carry sticks or weapons? No, it's just, just, yeah. They knew that, they know they, who they're going to arrest. You know, mm. it wasn't like, uh, we are very like harmless people. I never had any issue with anyone in my neighborhood or police or anything and now these guys coming from intelligence service and anyway they collected everything about christianity and put handcuffs on me my dad my sister my brother and put us separately in cars put a blindfold over my eyes and took me to a place um it was like intelligence service jail for the whole day questioning me and other people which I didn't know where they are. And I always had this blindfold over my eyes, questioning about our Christian faith activities, the house church, uh, people. And I was in total shock. What's happening? It was just like, in a, I'm in a movie. I couldn't believe it, you know? Why Oceans. were you so shocked? 
because had you never heard of this happening before or you just thought that's someone else, it would never happen to us? Yeah. I mean, for Christians, I never heard that before. Okay. Uh, like that. Uh, I know there was some restrictions, but especially happening to me, you know, I didn't expect that. I w- we just had a small gathering. So yeah, it was very shocking experiencing that, you know, the way that they were treating you, mm. like putting blindfold over your eyes. Who am I? I mean, so mm. you sure you came for the right person? Mm. And um, they put me in solitary confinement for 22 days. And during that time, they were questioning everything and threatening me to all sorts of stuff. Mm. And yeah, they released my family and just kept me because I was the most active one. And they released me by bail, sent me to court, and then they gave me eight months prison sentence. But it was a suspended sentence. They say, if you continue your activities, your Christian activities within the next five years, we will arrest you again and give you a new sentence. Mm. So it was like three of us, me and two other people who were leading these kind of gatherings. So we had to go to court, many sessions going to court together. Mm. And we had our little fellowship then literally behind the door before we go to, so we would pray. We would like just had lots of kind of mm. spiritual battles and stuff. And the court sessions was just God's power was pouring and we just say, this is what happened to us and Mm. we can't deny it Mm. because for each one of us Jesus was the only solution and fast forward after four years our small fellowship grew up to 150 200 people Mm. and we had like different meetings small gatherings and we had to like organize in such a security way and seeing like people coming to Christ and receiving healing or this powerful encounter with Jesus was amazing and one night, the same way that I was arrested, happened again in our, one of our worship meetings. Mm. But this time was real bad. And they put me in sort of confinement again for a month and sent me to prison for three years. And I was in prison, yeah, for almost two years that I heard my sentence, which was three years and eight months. And I spent three years and one month in prison. And then I got released. Mm. And in the midst of the prison, like, the second time was very difficult. Between I, when I was 24 to 27, I was in prison. And one of the days I was sitting, thinking about my life, especially there was a time that I was in a small room with no uh, like good facilities. And it was a horrible, horrible place with like other 30 people. I mean, bear in mind, the prison was very different with the prison here in uh, England. It was like massive prison with 8,000 prisoners in it, very overcrowded, like in a small room. With bunk beds, people, nine people, for example, in sleeping in beds and the rest of people sleeping on the ground, like literally, like mm, blinds. Side by side. Yeah, side by side. And very dirty. They, like the toilet always mm. was, most of the toilets were blocked and rats in the toilet. The air was so dirty. Mm. It was so like overcrowded that when you wanted to walk in the corridor, literally it was difficult to walk because so, so busy. And very violent uh, environment and Mm. like the prison itself, approximately every week there was one dead person like in fights. Mm. Someone was, yeah, being killed, fight over food or something. And the prison manager was very, very like horrible. Uh, And he was really against us as Christians. It was four of us in prison. Just four of you that you knew or only four out of the... Four out of the 8,000. I mean... I know that uh, there was some Christians came in and go out so quickly. Mm. We were the longest one because we were really active. Mm. And I was like, with this background, I was sitting and I was just thinking about my life, missing my family, living in this environment. And all just because I'm a Christian. All just because one day Jesus came to my life and saved my life. And I experienced that sweetness of his salvation, which overcame the whole bitterness of prison let me go through the whole thing and I was just sitting and just thinking about my life my my future where I'm gonna be at that time I didn't know my sentence at all as I said after two years waiting in this situation for my sentence and I just prayed that I said Jesus this pain and suffering I have today in prison is not comparable at all with the pain and suffering I had without you in my previous life this pain with you in this prison leading me to your embrace which is eternal life but that pain was leading me to absolute darkness i knew that emptiness that darkness 
living in that meaningless was so difficult, life without you. And I prefer to be in this pain, not in that pain. That is the power of gospel, you know, the good news of Jesus, the value of Jesus that became central to everything happened to me and is still happening because after that I became refugee in Turkey for three years. In Turkey, I was fully involved with church. It was a big church uh, with three congregations, Arabic speakings and Turkish speakings and Farsi speakings. I was one of the leaders of the Farsi speaking one. And my wife, Hanno, she came from England to our church to help one of our ministry areas, which was helping Syrian refugees. And I was a part of that team. She planned to like stay for six months and then we fell in love. I asked her out and then she had to stay for two years. Anyway, we got married and we moved to the UK in 2018. And then, yeah, coming to England was also difficult because it was very new situation, mm -hmm. completely different culture. And coming with the whole experiences I had, the changes in my life I had and coming here again in England, starting a new life from scratch was very difficult mm -hmm. and uh, improving my language as well. And after two years, there was opportunity. I always wanted to study theology and develop my skills, leadership skills and stuff for the church. And yeah, I was introduced to ordination in Church of England. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in the uh, ordination training. See Brilliant. Yeah. Our time has run away. I have so many more questions, but just what a story. I mean, God is good. And your story is one of hundreds and thousands now in Iran and with the diaspora Iranian Persian people whether they're in Los Angeles or Bradford or London, all over the world. And God is at work in ways we would never have imagined 20, 30 years ago. And many have suffered, as our brother here has shared. I have lots of questions about how did the Lord sustain you and about your family now? And how are you so bold today to be so public? Because there are many political refugees who've come out of Iran and they're very worried even about being known where they live in England and who in the Iranian community might tell on them and where they are and what they're doing. So I thank God not just for your faith and how Jesus has rescued you as he has us, but also for your boldness today to keep proclaiming his name, serving him, seeking him, and sharing with us um, and being so public about that. So thank you and to your family. Um, thank you so much for coming today. And I really hope we can continue the conversation in the future. Thanks for being with us today, guys. As we close, I want to offer you a gift. It's a beautiful invitation to come and join in with the mission of God, the transformational, life-giving gospel work that he has set before us. The Lord asks in Isaiah, Who will go? Whom shall I send? Could it be you? Might you be willing to lay it all down, to give up everything for the one who gave up everything for you? To join one of our teams in Central Asia, the Gulf, Africa, Asia, the Balkans, or the Caucasus? Or to support some of our work through prayer and finances? If your heart is stirred to respond, do reach out to us. You can contact me on matt at frontiers.org.uk or visit our website, frontiers.org.uk or you can check out our social media platforms at Frontiers UK. God bless, guys, and do join us next time for some more inspirational and challenging stories.